when you're in your 20s, right, it's all about finding out who you are, right? And when you're in your 30s, it's, at least for me, it was about accepting who I am. Actually, maybe even do I dare to like who I am. Now that, like, I'm in my, the, 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 the tail end of my 40s as I approach 50s, which is just, like, hard for me to believe, um, but what I found in the 40s is um, really it's about now being who you are. So knowing who you are, accepting who you are, and now being who you are. And so to, I think of that to your question, you know, what does it take for someone to make it through the long haul? Uh, what does it take for a pastor to really do well and succeed, to find some measure of, at quote unquote, success, as it were, in their church? I think that pastor needs to be free to be who he is. Hey friends, welcome to the Word Made Digital Podcast on YouTube. I'm the host, Joanna LaFleur, and this is season eight of the podcast. Thanks for joining, for catching these episodes. We're leaning into hope and positivity for the future because it's been a rough couple of years. So enjoy this episode of the podcast. And hey, if you wanna check out seven seasons of archives of the podcast, as well as tutorials, practical help for you in church communications, creative, websites, social media, we got it all here on the YouTube channel. So subscribe now and enjoy this episode. Tom Kang, welcome to Word Made Digital. I'm I'm already laughing, so I know we're gonna have a great conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm looking forward to it. It's an honor to yeah, be here. Please uh, tell us who, who are, who is Tom Kang? Because um, there will be some, like oh, some gosh. people who are familiar with you because we do have some mutual connections in ministry, yeah, we uh, do. Canadian American uh-huh. border crossing ministry, but uh, tell, tell yes. us who, who is Tom? Sure, sure. Well, um, thanks, thanks for having me, Joanna. And uh, yeah, who is Tom? What a great question. I've been asking myself that for the greater part of 40 years. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but you know, I was uh, born and raised in New Jersey. Uh, so don't hold that against me, please. Uh, you don't <laughs> sound born and like it. New Jersey. <laughs> I lost the accent, you know, maybe it's, uh, maybe I've been in California long enough, but I've lost the accent. Anyways, um, yeah, born and raised there to an uh, immigrant uh, Korean family. They immigrated in the early 70s uh, to America uh, from South Korea, from Seoul. And um, yeah, grew up in the church uh, for as long as I can remember. I mean, I was going to the church since I was in my mother's womb. And uh, grew up in a Korean American immigrant church uh, for most of my life. Um, uh, accepted Christ at an early age, around probably in uh, junior high, elementary. Uh, wasn't really walking with the Lord until uh, until I went to university, until I went to college. Uh, then went straight to uh, Dallas Theological. So actually, no, that's not even true. I didn't go straight to DTS. I went to a year um, of grad school at Columbia University in Manhattan, and then I went to uh, Dallas. Uh, and long story short, I went from uh, as as I was nearing um, the end of uh, what was it, the THM, I guess, uh, the degree. Um, so it was like a four year program. Nine uh, eleven happened. Oh wow! And again, being born and raised in New Jersey, yeah, yeah. So being, if you can imagine, right, being born and raised in New Jersey. Um, and then, you know, as, as you're nearing the end, the finish line of seminary, as it were, uh, to have something like 9-11 happen now, you know, my mom was working maybe 10 blocks away uh, from the World Trade Centers. I had several friends um, that were working either in the financial district or near uh, the, the Twin Towers. Um, actually, my roommate from Columbia actually, um, he was in one of the Twin Towers, uh, mm-hmm. Tower 2, and so he passed. Wow. Uh, so yeah, so like that was just obviously, you know, for the world, uh, it was, um, you know, just a tragic moment. Uh, but it it just hit personally for me as well. Uh, I was a newlywed at the time, Eric and I, we had just gotten married the year before. And, um, so we're just like, you know, as, as I'm nearing the end of seminary, we're just kind of like, okay, God, like before 9-11, we're like, okay, God, we're, where to next? You know, where, where's, where's the call? Where's the ministry? Where, where can I go and pastor? Well, when nine eleven happened, it was just kind of like, 
I don't know, it was kind of a no brainer. Uh, the, the home church that kind of sent me out, uh, that, that prayed for us, that spiritually supported us, relationally supported us, even financially supported us. They're like, Hey, would you come back Mm. and start a college ministry? And I was just like, yes, please. Like no brainer. Right. Like, so my wife also is from uh, New Jersey. And so it was a no brainer for us. Uh, we got to come back home to New Jersey, uh, start a college ministry really from scratch at the time we were, we were, uh, so our, a little bit about the church is called uh, Bethany United Methodist church. And it was at the time, it was one of the largest, uh, Korean American churches in New Jersey. Mm. Uh, and, uh, if you know anything about New Jersey, um, you know, it, it has a very large Korean American population. I would say probably LA has the largest Korean American population, but then out, uh, after that, it's probably the New York, uh, New Jersey area. And so it was a fairly large church. Um, but even so they had no college ministry. In fact, the only college kids that were attending at the time, uh, that church were probably like the senior pastor's kids, you know, uh, that kind of a situation. But, um, yeah, we stepped into that, started a college ministry. Um, and, uh, again, this is right after nine yeah. 11. Um, and we just, those were some, I mean, yeah, that, 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 that was a, those were pivotal times. That was a, that was an incredible time. And long story short, we went from that to, uh, we served there for about seven, eight years to a church, uh, called liquid church, which is a large multi-site church in New Jersey. Uh, lead pastor there is Tim Lucas, great guy, close friend of mine. And, um, uh, we left Bethany, our home church to go to liquid church at where I served as the teaching pastor for, I want to say seven and a half ish years huh. or eight years or so. Um, and then from there, uh, I'm really condensing. Yeah, everything. yeah. Uh, got a call to uh, Saddleback Church uh, here in uh, Lake Forest, California. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, Rick Warren being the lead pastor there and um, served there at Saddleback um, for about, what was it, close to four years, three and a half, three and a half years uh, as the men's pastor at the um, Saddleback, also a uh, multi-site church. Uh, I think at the time there were like 19 campuses or something like that, four global campuses. Uh, but I served at the uh, at the main uh, campus uh, in Lake Forest uh, in Orange County, California, uh, which is where I'm still at today. I still live here in Orange County. Uh, like, you know, suffering, like I said, I was there for three and a half years. My wife, as we, as, um, suffering as for we Jesus. Canadians might, might describe, <laughs> suffering for Jesus in Orange County. <laughs> Someone has to. Somebody Someone has, has to, to Joanna. I've, Some, I've been to the yeah, campus. Jesus loves Orange County too. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've been to yeah. the campus there, the campus and is it's huge. Um, yeah. you know it's a sight to see if you're if you're a church it, nerd or a church person like it, I am. I mean, it's amazing. It's Disneyland. To see. It is right? like a it's Disney Disneyland. church. Yeah. Yeah, you know they they it's you know they have trams that that take you from the parking lot to the main sanctuary. Disneyland is literally like fifteen twenty minutes yeah. away, uh, that sort of thing. So just an absolutely phenomenal church doing phenomenal things. Uh, was there for three and a half years, and um, then got the call to uh, lead a church in downtown Los Angeles, uh, which at the time. Uh, and I mentioned kind of before, like Los Angeles being the, the largest population of Korean Americans. Uh, at the time, this church was called Young Nock Celebration Church. Mm. And Young Nock Celebration Church was the English speaking ministry of Young Nock Church. Young Nock, uh, my Korean is horrible, but my understanding is that Young Nock means joy and in Korean. And so it was this part of, it was the English speaking ministry of Young Nock Church. Uh, which, you know, I mean, some would say it's probably the largest and oldest Korean American church uh, in the oh, U.S. Wow. So they have like a long history. Yeah, like a 30, 40 year history. Um, and so the English ministry uh, portion of it uh, was about has a, about a 30 year history or so. And they were basically looking to do something new uh, to kind of, if I use the analogy, kind of like the family analogy of, you know, think of, you know, you grow up, your kids grow up in a, in a parent's home and then they get a little older and maybe, you know, they go to school and whatnot, they get a job, but they're still living at home. Well, they, they wanted to like 
go out on their own and, 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 you know, move away from home and kind of start their own thing. Yeah. Um, and so that's what Young Knox Celebration Church wanted to do, the English speaking ministry. And so we did that. Um, because we're talking about the English speaking right. ministry would be second or maybe even mm-hmm. third generation Korean Americans yes, who don't speak exactly. Korean or, yeah. or don't speak it primarily. Um, yeah. It's a different, it's yeah. a different group. Speak, uh, yeah. as mo- yes. Uh, they, uh, many of them speak uh, uh, Korean as much as you do, Joanna. Uh, and so uh, that's, that's, uh, that's kind of the situation that it was. And um, that happened in 2018 is when I left Saddleback to go to Young Nak, uh, which is now called New Story Church. Uh, in the first, I, I'm not even kidding. I think it was in the first seven months or nine months, we we now we like to say we we slew the five big giants and that is the name the staff the vision the location the denomination like all the things you don't touch right like the sacred cows right like, yeah, you started like the, a new the, church the holy in the walls so of the old one uh, absolutely yeah. yeah we actually moved out of the walls oh we, wow we oh you locations. did that too that was one of the big five yeah, we actually moved twice. I think. Yeah, we moved twice in the in the first seven nine months. Uh, but yeah, the name, the staff, the location, the denomination, the vision, like everything, everything. And uh, we went from Young Knock Celebration Church to uh, a church called New Story, New Story Church, and that's what we've been since 2018. And uh, here we are in 2022. It's been it's been quite a journey. Wow. And um, my understanding is, you know, <laughs> speaking of the location of your church. Um, tell us about yeah. that because uh, I think it's in like a like a, yeah. a poor zip code or tell us about the Down. dynamic of where you're at. As much as I'm joking about your suffering yeah. for Jesus, tell us about like what actually is going on <laughs> in, in your neighborhood. Yeah, uh, sure, sure. Uh, the ch- church is located in DTLA, downtown Los Angeles. Uh, and when I say downtown Los Angeles, I mean, it is truly in downtown Los Angeles. I would say, uh, uh, you know, uh, the crypto.com center, which is formerly known as, you know, Staples Center, um, <laughs> where the Lakers play and the Clippers and all that. That is about a mile. Mm-hmm. I, it's less than two miles away. It's about a mile and a half away. Uh, and if you think of the letter L, like if that's if that's Staples Center or, or crypto.com center, um, uh, New Story Church is right here at the joint, mm-hmm. and then over here, a, less than a mile away, is USC, okay. like the heart of USC. So, like, we are truly in downtown uh, Los Angeles. Um, we're in one of the um, most underserved and impoverished areas of Los Angeles. Uh, Los Angeles is a huge city, obviously one of uh, one of the world's largest, four point two. Uh, million people, uh, and, and you know what's different about Los Angeles as opposed to like New York City, where everything's concentrated. Uh, you know, you've got like pretty much Manhattan. Uh, you got the five boroughs, but like Manhattan is what everyone thinks of. Los Angeles is more spread out. Yeah. Uh, but there are downtown areas, and and we just happen to be uh, in downtown. And so, when you did all these major moves, was that part of the strategy mm. for you as a church community? Like, was it like we want to call, feel called? Or or have a vision to serve this particular neighborhood mm-hmm. it was like here's a building we can afford let's go there like <laughs> yeah 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 no no yeah uh, great question uh, we had some history so like um you know uh, how shall i explain this um when i got there uh young knock met uh, in this one area of los angeles kind of like it, you know you think of your mom's house right in this one area of los angeles uh on broadway um, and that's where everyone kind of congregated. Now they had, before I even got there, they had uh, also started a, basically a multi-site in another area of downtown Los Angeles, where we're currently at right now, uh, in a place uh, basically on uh, Jefferson Boulevard, uh, which was about a 20 minute drive away. And um, so when I got there, what we did is we said we didn't know what we were going to mm. do, but we wanted to get both groups together mm. uh, in meeting in one place. And so we did that uh, at a place called uh, LATTC, Los Angeles Trade Tech College. We met in a tent wow. uh, for the greater part of a year. And uh, yeah, you know, we were going very Old Testament there. <laughs> <laughs> but the idea. 
<laughs> the idea was, you know, we do have a bunch of these sojourners, as it were, uh, and we just wanted to meet mm. uh, in one place at one time. Um, and we did that, like I said, for the greater part of the year. And as we were doing that, we knew that we wanted to move out of mom's house, so to speak, Broadway. Uh, but we had this location here in Jefferson that we we didn't know at that time, we didn't know really what we wanted to do. It needed renovations. So we were getting some renovations done, this, that, and the other. Um, and, uh, and, and so now, uh, after being in that tent for nine months, we've, we've since renovated and relocated to that Jefferson mm. area, which is in downtown mm. Los Angeles. Um, as far as vision and heart go though, um, you know, our vision is to reach 1% of LA in Jesus name. Uh, like I mentioned before, LA is a city of 4.2 million people. I'm not a math guy, but from what I hear, that's uh, about 42,000 people. One uh, percent would be. Now, I'm not saying that you know we want to do. We want to have a mega church of forty thousand people. Uh, you know, I've done the mega church thing. I've been there, done that. That's that. That's not exactly where my heart mm-hmm. is. Uh, I'm not trying to be that guy, uh, so to speak. Nothing wrong with that guy, but I'm just. That's not me. Um, but when I say we want to reach, uh, we want to fall deeper in love with Christ and reach 1% of LA, I'm just saying, hey, can you go out there in Jesus' name? Can we as a church go out there in Jesus' name and and just love on people? They don't have to come to our church. I don't care if they don't have to step foot. Uh, but can you be the salt and light uh, to this city? And can we in that way reach 1% of LA? Uh, but I tell you something, and we might get into this a little bit later, Joanna. Um, at the time, four years ago, when I said this, when I shared this, my heart, and just shared this with our church, at the time, it sounded ridiculous. It sounded audacious. Like, well, are you crazy? What are you talking about? Like, uh, I think when I stepped foot uh, into uh, Young Knock uh, New Story Church at that time, I think there were about maybe 500, 600 people. Mm-hmm. So to, like, say 1% of LA, 42,000 was ridiculous Mm. right but what's crazy is we just had this conversation uh, a couple days ago with some friends they're like pastor tom you realize you realize like we passed forty-two thousand people like a long time ago right uh as a matter of fact this food food pantry that we do we so every uh, during the height of the pandemic we met uh we opened up our church our the the church literally it was like the whole malachi thing right where the church becomes the storehouse uh that our church served as a storehouse to dtla downtown los angeles and um we just we just gave out uh, food and resources, especially to single moms, things like diapers and formula and um, groceries and whatnot. Uh, and we served over a quarter million people. Come on. During, yeah. It's, it, it's outrageous. Like, and you're uh, a church of, of, in they the did, hundreds. They like, this whole report. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Hundreds of people yeah. serving and, and, you know, hundreds CNN of thousands. CNN came, did report, wow. NBC, ABC. Absolutely, absolutely. So it's just like, and that was all through, during the pandemic, right? right? And so it's just kind of, it's a very humbling thing because like, I certainly could have. I don't think any person could have like thought that, oh, so what's your goal? What's your plan to reach 1% of LA? Like if you asked me back in 2018, I'd be like, I don't know, preach the gospel, <laughs> like love people. But like, it took a pandemic, which none of us saw, right, um, to create these opportunities. And just like a, like you know, trying as it may sound, just like trust and obey, mm. uh, you know, follow God every day, and 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 let's try to be faithful with the decisions that we have in front of us. And one thing just led to another, which led to another, and then you know, a few months later, we've served you know a quarter million people, like literally. 250,000 plus people. Wow. Wow. Um, wow. Wow. And it's just been a, it's been a blessing. It's been, it's been incredible. Well, I mean, there's lots of, it would lead me to ask all kinds of like logistical questions about yeah. that. But the, the thing that's actually sure. most in my mind at the moment is if, if mm. you, you started your ministry at like a time of, mm-hmm. you started a new thing at a time of crisis, nine 11, you're starting a brand new <laughs> young, yeah. young adults or student min- campus ministry. Oh. Um, social, mm. economic, political crisis. Fast forward, we're talking mm. about a, a pandemic, different, but mm. the themes of mm-hmm. upheaval, 
yeah, fear, yeah, yeah. crisis, economic, political, whatever. Sure. So um, you For seem sure. you seem like God keeps like doing things with you and your leadership in these moments. I, I'd love if you've ever thought about it or not. Like, yeah. are there some themes there? Okay, like, so, what, what happens in the hearts yeah, of people yeah. during these moments? <clears throat> so, yeah. So I'm going to be totally honest, Joanna. I'm getting goosebumps right mm. now because I've actually never pieced it together the way that you wow. just did. Oh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> so here I am. I'm living it, and you're just like listening for a few minutes, and you're like, oh, oh and connecting the dots. And I'm just like, okay, why haven't I? See, I'm telling you, he just uses the foolish, right? He uses. Uh, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just seeing like a theme I'm telling here. You, That's I, all I'm I, saying. I, don't, I thought you were telling me this I, to tell me no. about this theme. So I'm, I thought I was queuing you up here. No, I wish I was because that would be brilliant. <laughs> well, maybe then you can uh, say like no, I, you, the first crisis. I actually haven't pieced it together yeah. that way. Gosh. And maybe yeah. just, you know, is there anything that when you've been going through the last couple of years, especially those early like 2020 days where everyone was in a panic, nobody mm. understood the pandemic. Mm. Everyone was wondering if we're all going to die. Nobody Good. knew. Um, but yeah. that was the yeah. level of fear and crisis at 9-11 different issue but like mm-hmm. people were really afraid yeah. people were looking for god in ways they hadn't before mm-hmm. i don't know i'm just for curious sure. if it, you for know sure. if there's any anything there that you would reflect on that's i love this. it yeah yeah no yeah it, 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 and i want to i want to clarify it's not to say that i haven't done any reflection on the time <laughs> sure. past and the tragedy and yeah. whatnot for sure um but just quite you know connecting the dots that way like even like you know that was the start of my you know kind of full time ministry as it were and and just to see where we are now it, um yeah to connect the dots that way that is interesting you know i would say you know to answer your question directly um Going back to 9-11, I mean, I was so young, right? Mm-hmm. I was just a kid out of seminary, like a newlywed, and very much it was, um, hey, let's figure this out to get like what what is actually happening, and let's 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 get together for prayer, let's get together to fellowship, let's get together for like what does scripture have to say about this? And we were just so young and energetic. I, I was in my mid to late twenties uh at the time and you know you're surrounding yourself with a bunch of college kids and so late hours but that never feels late or anything like that. Um now, you know, with this pandemic uh more recently it's you know, there there is the pressure where 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 eyes do look to you uh, for the answers, for the solution, for the next steps, and it is very different in that sense. Um, what's what's similar, uh, whereas you know, back with nine eleven, it's just kind of like we're all looking around for the leaders. Yeah. And it's funny you mentioned uh, you know people searching for God, and then I, I remember Tim Keller's message uh, at Redeemer Church uh, during nine eleven. I think like the week. Of nine eleven happened on Tuesday. That Sunday, uh, I believe, was still the highest attendance uh, at Redeemer Church. Uh, I think still to this day. That, I, I might be, I might be wrong about that, wow. but at least back then it was. Um, and so, anyways, I was looking to the, to the Tim Kellers of the world uh, for the answers then because I didn't know what I was doing. Uh, not to say that I, I'm not looking for Tim to the Tim Kellers of the world now yeah. uh, during the pandemic, but uh, the roles are are, are, are very different. And, um, but I tell you what is the same, and that is, I don't know if this, you know, I'm just going to be honest because, because uh, I don't, I don't think this is a, the greatest thing in the world, but I, I, I think I, um, I thrive on chaos. Mm. I, I like, I would even say I like chaos. Like I'm okay with it. No, I, I think I like it because um, there's a there's a focus that it demands and a uh, yeah just a focus and a level of commitment that it demands that uh, that extracts the best of me that I think the you know just the normal everyday ho hum um, doesn't do and this I have thought about. My wife and I, my wife Erica and I, we've talked about this, and I've uh, I've shared this with some others as well. Um, every situation that I've stepped into, 
So like we just talked about like 9-11 and the pandemic, right? But every situation that I've stepped into, I've been asked to start something new, Hmm. to kind of like mess things up, right? To deconstruct, as it were, very popular word, uh, but then reconstruct something new. Uh, and so that was the case when I stepped into ministry after 9-11 to start up a college ministry. Um, that was the case when I became uh, from I transitioned from the college pastor to the English uh, speaking pastor there, the English ministry. Uh, that was the case when I went to Liquid. Uh, that was absolutely certainly the case when I went to Saddleback. Uh, you know, it was basically like, here's what the men's ministry was. Uh, which was great, and it served its purpose, and and God used it tremendously to to impact thousands of men uh, for a time. But now we're sensing something new, and it needs something new, and so have at it. Um, and so that's what I got to do there, and and now certainly at uh, when I came to Young Knock Celebration, now New Story Church. I mean, we you know I already shared like the 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 five giants, as it were, and so. I like that. And I don't, the, the weird thing is I don't seek that. I don't go in seeking. Mm. And, and I will also say this, at, at every stop, I thought I would be there for life. So in other words, when I graduated seminary, when we went to Bethany, I was like, okay, great. I'm not going to be one of those pastors, revolving door, you know, average 10 years, like two years, and then you're out. Because, like, I, 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 like, this is my home church. This is where, you know, I received the call. This is where I met my wife. Like, of course, mm. we're going to stay here. And we did it. Seven, eight years later, we wound up at Liquid. Once I was at Liquid, fell in love, just just amazing team dynamics. You know, just God was building something new. I think I was the I was the first outside hire. I was like staff member number eight. Mm. But by the time I left, you know, we had a staff of over a hundred. Uh, and we you know, we went from like one campus of like, I don't know, 400 people to like four campuses and 4,000 people. I, I, I don't know. I don't know all the numbers, but it was, you, you get the idea. Um, and yeah, the yeah. Same, same things with Saddleback. It's just, just, just new stuff. I, I I've never sought, uh, you know, to, to rearrange and change things up or anything like that. Um, but that's just, that's just the situations that I get led yeah, into. Yeah. I think it's interesting. I, I'd like to talk to you more about sort of the moment we're in, now, but before we, because you've been mentioning Saddleback, yeah. I'd like to, you know, you know, not that mm. you are not the uh, spokesperson for Saddleback, but I'm thinking about Saddleback mm. now because uh, Rick Warren's, you know, he's announced his retirement. Sure. This, you know, sort of legendary mm. pastor of a generation. Absolutely. Um, in the midst Absolutely. of, you know, juxtaposed with, you know, a lot of crappy stories in the news yet again about about yeah. pastor um moral failures or whatever they all it's different with everybody but it's sure. always the same story uh yeah. you know these sort of implosions yeah. so I, i'm curious to sort of mm. as you've had a bit of an inside view you know what is mm. you know what do you think about the longevity of Rick Warren? Is it that he, like, you know, mm-hmm. is he, is he uh, meditating half the day? Like, how does he, how, how, how have you <laughs> observed him as a leader with this longevity? Yeah. In the midst of like some really yeah. crappy stuff happening, not just crappy, but tragic things happening in his family. Sure. You know, Absolutely. I'd love to hear some, yeah. just any, any thoughts you have around, yeah, around that enough. as we look towards him yeah. retiring. Right, right. You know, I'm not just saying this because it's the polite thing to say or anything like that. Um, but I, I, I've been a big fan of uh, Pastor Rick um, since like day one. The first, uh, uh, my dad's only given me two books, like physical books. Uh, the first one was written in Korean, so I just never read it. <laughs> I don't know what 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 the thought there was. It was like before Google Translator as yeah. well, so like I don't know what the thought there was. But the but the second book, uh, I was you know a, a, a seminary student, Dallas Theological Seminary, and he gave me a purpose driven church, you know, and um, and I'm just like you know like 
total like arrogant, you know, 20 year old thing. I'm just like, oh, dad, what do you know about church? Blah, blah, blah. Like, you know, I'm going to seminary right now. But what he, he was an elder at, at, at his church and, and the elder team went to Saddleback to one of the purpose driven conferences. And uh, he just fell in love with everything there. And he's just like, listen, you, you, you need to know this stuff. You need to read this stuff. And I did what any uh, normal godly son would do. I just took the book and I chucked it, you know, <laughs> but, but, a couple of years later, I was like, "Hey, where was that book again? Let me let me find this thing and read it, and I fell in love." And so, I've been a fan of uh, Pastor Rick since you know the the nineties, uh, the nineteen hundreds, <laughs> uh, as the kids say. So you know, when I uh, to to be honest, uh, you know, when I was at Liquid. Um, I, I was not looking to leave Liquid. I, I loved Liquid, you know, born and raised in Jersey. God's doing this tremendous thing uh, through Liquid Church to my home state, all this stuff. Um, but in the back of my head, I always knew, like, there's only one church in the world I would ever leave Liquid Church for, and that is Saddleback Church. Uh, wow. Because, like, you know, just, just because of Pastor Rick's uh, incredible vision, uh, his incredible giftedness, his anointing there, um, and just like literally, right? Like, like, like a lot of the churches that you and I know and people listening, I mean, they got their playbook, yes, of course, from the Bible. But, uh, you know, maybe, maybe their second playbook was Purpose Driven Church, mm-hmm. um, whether they realize it or not. And so just the opportunity to to come under his ministry and under his leadership. And I will say, Joanna, um, uh, I've had the a unique opportunity to meet a lot of different people. Um, but I have to say, um, after meeting Rick, spending time with him, there was a time, there was a there was a season um towards the end of my time there where I met with him weekly. Um so I got to be in a, a weekly uh, leaders meeting there uh and i'll say he's he's one of the very few where he has this reputation that precedes him yeah where as you get closer to him you're actually you're actually more um humble and thankful Mm. um than not uh unfortunately i've been in situations where you know you meet people and you're like you know you, you you think all these great things and um yeah, and you, yeah. And you just meet him, and you're you're a little bit kind of let down or, or, or whatnot, yeah. but not with Pastor Rick. No. Um, he really is the real deal, yeah. and um, you know, no one's perfect, right? Uh, and he'd be the first to say uh, that he's not perfect, but gosh, you know, he is so down to earth. Um, he loves Jesus. Um, he's all about um, just one more person coming to Christ. Mm-hmm. Uh, just one more person taking their next spiritual step, and uh, I've just learned so. I'm I'm indebted to him and his ministry mm-hmm. so much. So, I mean, what do you think it is that not just for for him specifically then, but you know, as you look at, I imagine as you say, like when you come to a place, you think you're going to be there uh, for life. I mean, what I'm hearing is you have a heart Forever. for a lifelong ministry. You're you're not temporarily in yeah. a career. So what are some of those? Absolutely. You know, yeah. I mean, what are some of those things? Like, I'm sure like, like many pastors is very sobering to hear about all these stories. And mm. I would imagine it gives mm. us all pause on mm. our own life. But like, what are some things that mm-hmm. pastors need <laughs> to be successful mm. in the long mm. term? And, and whether you are having them, mm. you know, having all these check boxes in your life or not, maybe isn't the point, but you know, Mm -hmm. like what do, what do they need from their people? What do they need in their health? Like what are some of these things you see when you think of the guys who've gone, the guys or the girls who've gone the long haul, you know, what are some of those markers? That's a great question. Um, Joanna, I I think, so there, there are three things that come to mind. Um, You know, when, when you're in your, 20s, right? It's all about finding out who you are, right? And when you're in your 30s, it's at least for me, it was about accepting who I am. Actually, maybe even do I dare to like who I am? Yeah. Now that like I'm in my, the 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 tail end of my 40s as I approach 50s, which is just like hard for me to believe. Um <laughs> but what I found in the 40s is um really it's about 
now being who you are. So knowing who you are, accepting who you are, and now being who Mm. you are. And so I think of that to your question, you know, what does it take for someone to make it through the long haul? Uh, What does it take for a pastor to really do well and succeed, to find some measure of uh, quote unquote success, as it were, in their church? I think that pastor needs to be free to be who he is. In order for that pastor to be who he is, he has to understand how God has made him, right? He has that, that's the hard work of, and, and accepting, uh, uh, you know, how God has made him. And so like, for me, like, listen, I'll never be Rick Warren. I totally get that. There's only one Rick Warren. I'll never be a Tim Lucas. There's only one You could build like, you could get a goatee though. I mean, if you want to start looking like. (laughs) That's about it. (laughs) <laughs> I, I I could I could get a goatee and I could you know I could put on a Hawaiian shirt <laughs> to conjure up the '90s version of Rick, you know. But that that's about yeah. it, right? Like God's uniquely gifted uh, these people uh, in, in that in those specific ways. And you know, I'll be honest, like for the early you know the, for for part of my 20s and, and certainly 30s, like that's what you chase after, right? Oh, I need to. I need to be like Rick. I need to be like Tim Keller. I need to be like whoever. Name name that person. Um, and it's just like, wait, but God hasn't created me that way. Like, no, I'm I'm Tom Kang. Your first question, who is Tom Kang? Right. Well, that's a that's a question that you know that we all uh, for ourselves respectively have to ask, answer, come to terms with, and then, gosh, as soon as you do that, Lord willing, then you get to be that person. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's where the joy, that's where the peace, and uh, if we can even use the word success, I think that's where that's where it comes into play. Yeah, yeah, I think it's so true. Um, well, I love that. Mm. I love that it's starting with this identity piece. I mean, there's lots of things probably mm. around therapy and taking a day off, and sure, you know, sure, loving yeah. your spouse and and whatever, but. All those things are important. Yeah, but I think even that, like Sabbath rest is about identity. We're not our work. Like loving your partner Mm -hmm. is because of our identity, you know, and our covenant with, you know, all these things. Actually, it's interesting that you're talking about this core work of identity, um, you know, beneath it. Um, So (laughs) the uh, the, there's a I'm switching gears now because there's this topic that struck me this phrase that. I don't know if you've coined it or I haven't heard much of it before, but you called it a, a digital Pentecost. Mm. And I think it's referring back to <laughs> yeah. what you're talking about the last couple of years. I think you're talking maybe about food pantry stuff, but this idea, talk to me, mm-hmm. what does this mean? This You, you were in a digital Pentecost or were experiencing yeah. a digital Pentecost. Uh, t- tell me about yeah, this. Yeah, that's whole funny thing. that you mentioned that. Yeah. Yeah, that's funny. That's funny you mentioned it. So so observant. Gosh, Joanna, I wish uh, I wish everyone <laughs> was uh, w- w- was that observant. Um, I actually remember the exact date. It was March fifteenth. The Ides of March. Beware the Ides of March. March fifteenth, twenty twenty. And I, the reason I remember that date was because that was the first Sunday um, where LA was shut down, like the rest of the world, and we had to go digital. Mm. Um, we, we, we closed our church, our physical church doors. Right. Uh, and we thought it would only be, I thought it would be like, you know, it was March 15th. I thought surely by Easter, uh, a month later, we'll be back in person. We were all talking about two weeks Uh, of staying home, right? (laughs) Yes. Yeah. Two weeks turned out to be about 20 months. Yeah. Uh, closer to 20 months than it was two weeks. Uh, but I remember on March 15th, um, it was right before I got up. Uh, you know, we had the live stream that was going on, the worship, and everything was like so, you know, mix and match, helter skelter. Like, no, none of us really knew what we were doing uh, and whatnot. Uh, we had had an online. I would call it a presence before March 15th. In other words, like we would archive our messages and whatnot, but we didn't really give as much intentional thought to online ministry. Um, Certainly uh, uh, as we did uh, the months uh, and years following. But anyways, I just remember uh, right before uh, getting up um, behind the pulpit, uh, just having this, I don't know. I just felt like God was just, calming me down Mm. 
uh, because I was nervous. Uh, I was nervous. I was excited. I was clueless, you know, and God just um, calming me down. And I just thought of the church in Acts uh, that came to mind, that came to heart and the Holy Spirit descending. And then from that point uh, at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit descends and people catch on fire. Uh, as it were, and God spread his church. Mm. And I was just like, well, that's what's happening right now. The church is scattered. We're not gathered. We're scattered. Uh, This is a new medium, but the message hasn't changed. Um, God's still doing his thing. God's still in control. And though it's chaotic right now, uh, we have a creator uh, that's uh, in perfect control. He's not hes not wigged out. He's not nervous about this. This hasn't caught him by surprise. Um, and God's going to continue to work. And I just, I just, I don't, I don't know. I just, I said this, I feel like this is a digital Pentecost. I remember thinking that right before I got in front of the camera and, um, And then I remember just sharing it then and there. I think we were, I think we had a panel uh, uh, for that first message. And and I remember just saying it uh, and it's, it's stuck with me. It's it's stuck with a few others as well. Uh, But for most people, it just kind of went over their heads or, or, you know, was, was forgettable or or whatnot. Um, But yeah. And the reality is, is God did use that time. You know, I mentioned the food pantry, uh, but also just like, you know, there's some incredible stories of how, because we were the church online, people came to Christ. People then got baptized. People's lives were changed. Marriages were changed. Um, relationships were changed. And so, yeah, yeah, I kind of stand by yeah, it. You talk about, there was this, I like this expression you used too. It started out high tech and now it's high touch. So Touch. you started yeah. with these, yeah. did you started trying, okay, shoot, we got to figure out this digital ministry thing, but then it moved immediately right. into this high right. touch quarter of a million people food thing. Absolutely. Yeah. Cause we, it couldn't just be like church online can't just be about information dissemination, mm-hmm. right? It can't just be like this high tech experience. Like right now you and I are enjoying this high tech experience, right? We've got video camera, podcast, all that stuff, which is great. I believe God can use that. And he obviously does use that. Um, but it doesn't stop there, right? It, it has to, there has to be a high touch experience. Uh, and the way that I think about online ministry, to be quite honest, is like, I think of it like, like online dating, Yeah. right? Um, my wife and I, we met the traditional way, if you will, like, yeah, it, it, like it really is cliche. Like we met at church, you know, that kind of a thing. Um, but many of our friends, I would actually say like close to half of our friends uh, who are now married, met online Mm. uh and so like what is the purpose of like online dating well eventually the purpose of online dating is actually to like meet physically right and even get married right um and so like it's not just about just like meeting people online and staying online forever and ever amen right and i just i think i think there's an element of that to to church online as well i think um you do the best that you can and there are ways um, that you can reach people um, and minister to people uh, online that you could not, that you cannot do uh, because of time and space in a physical manner. Um, but then also it needs to be a part of, it needs to be a, not a replacement, but a supplement yeah. uh, of the overall picture. When So hence high tech, high so touch. So how has or has your preaching, you're, you're a preacher, mm-hmm. communicator, you know, I would imagine that would be very high on your gift mix list, uh, you know, mm-hmm. and primary part of your role. Uh, how has how has mm-hmm. this digital hybrid thing? And now it sounds like you're in person and online. Uh, you're online and yes. moving people yes. to from high tech to high tech. Like you're, this is all happening at the same yes. time in real time. So how does that affect yes. you? You know, thinking yes. of people listening who are communicators uh, themselves. Mm-hmm. How has it affected mm-hmm. how you preach or what you preach or how long you preach or yeah, are you wearing yeah. makeup uh, now? Everything. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not wearing makeup. Maybe I should, <laughs> uh, but no, 
Uh, I'm not wearing makeup, have no plans on wearing makeup. Uh, but it, it has affected um, the whole preparation point of, uh, of preaching, right? And even, you know, we have a quote unquote production team, right? Um, so like it's changed everything. And how could it not, right? Because we went from one main medium to now truly a hybrid medium. And if you, it, yeah, if, if you don't um, then rearrange things, I mean, it's affected every, everything, like even staffing, right? Like our, our staffing has changed. Um, yeah. Our production uh, pre- preparation for the week's services changed. Um, my, I mean, I for sure, my preaching style has had to adjust. Mm -hmm. Um, I, you know, it used to be, uh, pre-pandemic, it used to be, I'm thinking of Joanna in the seat, you know, what is she going through? Spirit of God, through your word, help me to speak to Joanna, right? Um, Now it's like, that person may not be there. That may not be in the room. In fact, they may not even be, chances are, if they're watching online, they're not even watching at 11 o'clock yeah. a.m. on a Sunday or, a, you know what I mean? And so, like, um, so everything from my illustrations to my delivery to my uh, preparation, that all has to have that uh, in mind and in yeah. heart uh, as I prepare. Um, I have, I want to close on, I we're asking everybody just a few fun rapid fire questions before we close. But before that, oh the, the, maybe yeah. the last, um, you know, meteor question, it, I, I would love for you to sure. just like, you know, speak to and encourage others who are leaders in ministry who are, I mean, a lot of people uh, have had a rough couple of years, big transition change, mm. especially if you don't like change or you're a bit older and you've had to do a lot of change that mm. you're not as savvy about, you know, and then you've had this amazing, mm. this amazing story. I want to link to it in the show notes around mm. the food pantry stuff mm. and a quarter of a million people mm. being served. Um, you know, mm. is there something mm. that, you know, you would exhort or encourage other leaders to try and do mm. or, um, you know, what, what might you say to that? Yeah. I love it, Joanna. And um, the first thing that comes to mind is actually, <laughs> it's a little bit of the op- the exact opposite of what I said earlier. And that is how, like, I'm kind of drawn to chaos and, like, those, those kind of hectic moments. Um, but I'm reminded of the sobriety, so to mm-hmm. speak. And, uh, the, the stillness and the, oh gosh, what's, what's the word? Like the, the word that comes to mind is just the, the everyday normalcy of Jesus's ministry. And what I mean by that specifically is, um, you know, you think of the passages in the gospel where it talks about the disciples on the boat and them being afraid it's in the middle of the night and they see this figure they think it's a ghost and peter's just like oh, jesus if that lord if that's you tell me to walk on water we get the whole scene yeah. um and those walk on water moments 9 11 start of the pandemic um they are chaotic they are exhilarating they are supernatural super normal uh abnormal even um however you know, walking on water are, is all those things, but 99.999% of Jesus's ministry was walking in dirt. Mm. Wow. In the normal, in the ordinary. And so my encouragement uh, to anyone listening, uh, my encouragement to that pastor uh, that you kind of painted that beautiful picture of maybe a pastor who's a little bit older, who may feel insufficient or inadequate in today's ever-changing world and, uh, you know, talk about high tech and whatnot is, oh my gosh, no, 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 we need you. We need you. Uh, Your work in the everyday dirt of ministry, in the everyday mundane and ordinary of ministry, that that that's the that's the meat that's the backbone that's the that's the that's the very fiber that's the that's the everything that Jesus did uh, 99.99% of the times he can use the catalytic moments of the pandemic of a 911 of 
insert whatever tragedy or drama or chaos that you have. Um, he can use those catalytic moments to be clarifying moments, to be um, moments of recommitment, uh, moments of, of heart resurgence, if you will. Uh, but my gosh, what 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 are those re, what are those recommitment moments used for? They're used for those ninety nine percent moments in the dirt. Yeah. Um, Love it. I hope that yeah, makes it sense. totally does. Thanks, Tom. Okay, um, mm. rapid fire. A place, a yes, place, okay. I love a place that people should travel that they've probably never been to. It could be like in your own neighborhood or far, far away and exotic. Big Sur, Big Sur. I am, I am shocked how many people, especially local Californians born and raised in California, have not. Uh, visited Big Sur. Uh, uh, so Big Sur is just north uh, of LA. It's about a five hour drive north of LA. Y- you may know Big Sur very well, but it's like the Monterey, um, yeah, uh, Mount Carmel, uh, Mount Carmel, the, the Carmel, the Air, Carmel by drive. the Sea area. A uh, Highway One Drive. Oh my gosh, the coastline that you see. It's these like wild beaches, cliffs. It's just. It, it is breathtaking. Like you feel like you're in a movie. You you feel like it is draw. It is literally jaw wow. dropping. It, it's beautiful. Yeah. I've been there and I did it in a convertible, which I would say to add to your recommendation, oh, worth the extra money to blessings. get the rental convertible you, for the views. You are highly anointed. <laughs> I rise up and call you blessed. I rise up and call you blessed. Okay, you, you may have already <laughs> answered this question, but I'll ask it. Um, okay. A book that's changed how you think about something. Oh, uh, Jesus and John Wayne. Ah. The, 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 you know, the, um, oh, gosh, what's yeah. her name? Uh, I'm blank. Oh, it's right here. Oh, my gosh. It's right here. It's right here. It's I right just here. did that audio book. Jesus. Oh, it, it's, it, she's yeah. incredible. Isn't it? She does quite a work. And again, you're talking to the former men's pastor. Hmm. Right uh, at Saddleback Church, the huge mega yeah. church, right, and so it's just like um, I was like, man, where was this book? Oh, wow. uh, you know, a few years huh. ago. Um, so this is this is for sure. Uh, but also, I would I would also say I would throw up. You know, so that's that's like um, you know that's a recent book. Uh, but for me personally, um, uh, the Jesus I Never Knew by Philip Yancey mm-hmm. that changed my life mm-hmm. uh, over twenty years ago. Um, just the way that he presented the Jesus I thought I knew, you know, and grew up with my whole life. Uh, he presented it in such a fresh and new way. And that, that's like one of my number one recommendations to anyone and everyone. It's just a, it's just a classic, I think. Uh, Bill Biancy's Jesus I Never Knew. A movie that made you cry. Glory. Okay. Uh, you know, the scene where Denzel Washington, he, he's getting whipped for stealing shoes. And like, you know, Denzel Washington, who doesn't love Denzel Washington, but there's that one scene where just this one tear, I mean, it just, it just, you know, just being abused and harnessing all this pain and just this one single tear drops. Uh, and then of course, uh, you know, they all die, which made me cry. <laughs> Spoiler, Spoiler alert. alert. I, I think everyone's seen it. <laughs> it's, like, it's like over a 20 year movie. So last yeah, one, sure your go to, you got 50, you're mm. in one of those 50 ice cream flavor shops. What's your go to ice cream flavor? Mm. Chocolate chip cookie dough. Oh, good one. Chocolate chip cookie dough. No doubt whatsoever. <laughs> I'll, I and I've tried a lot of, I've tried a lot of different variations, uh, but uh, chocolate chip cookie dough is always a, a go to. Oh man. Okay. So how about you? Um, I usually would go for a mint chip. Okay, and, that's yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I live in a house full of four women, my wife and three daughters, and that that is a very popular one in this. I'll house say as this: well. if I've just eaten a meal, mint chip is the way to go. It's yeah. light enough that you can eat yeah. it after you've had a yes. big meal. Yeah. If I haven't I just had a meal, I'm going to go for like a cookie dough or yeah. cookies and cream, something like that. Got it. Here's the thing about mint chocolate chip: I can't get over the green. Uh, but anyways, yeah. anyways, I get it. <laughs> I mean, it's okay. it tastes delicious. <laughs> So are you the guy who like what's there's this movie where some character only eats the brown M and M's because like they're the most naturally colored oh, they don't eat the green and the blue yeah. ones because they like, like are artificial thing? or whatever maybe this is this yeah. is your kind of person <laughs> yeah exactly okay Tom exactly. To, to wrap this up if people want to find more about you or maybe your church where do you want to send them on the internet today. 
Yeah, uh, newstorychurch.com uh, is, is our church website. I'm not like a big blogger. I'm not trying to be like a Christian celebrity or anything like that. So like newstorychurch.com. Find me uh, on Facebook, Tom Kang, Instagram, Tom Kangsta. Uh, <laughs> awesome. Yeah. So. Awesome. Tom, thank you so much. I've enjoyed the conversation. I think people will feel encouraged by it as well. I'm just excited to hear about what God's doing mm. in your church. And it is, mm. sounds like a new story. Mm. So it's exciting. Yeah, yeah. God bless you. <laughs>